prayer, folks, is to, to see this at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Um, we're not here because this is the place where Jesus prayed the prayer. Um, of course, Matthew, who has the form that you've got in your booklets, um, puts it with the Sermon on the Mount. The sermon probably wasn't a sermon that Jesus ever preached, not in so many words. He didn't sit down and work his way through all of the stuff in the Sermon on the Mount, but Matthew took the heart of Jesus' preaching and put it together in a sermon. What we can be pretty sure of, for those of you who are keen on such things, is that the stuff in the Sermon on the Mount is, is as close as we get to authentic Jesus. This is what Jesus said and it, it, was, it was put down, you know, it, it was recorded. So when we come to the Lord's Prayer, we're talking about the prayer that Jesus prayed. And I want, to, I want to, to suggest to you that we look at it as a prayer that under occupation, if you're going to live like this, it's a prayer that's guaranteed to get you killed. It's a revolutionary prayer. It's also a disciple's prayer. And you know, part of what we're doing is saying, what does it mean to be a disciple of Jesus, a follower of Jesus who walks away? Well, part of it is to pray daily and live by this prayer, not as some sort of religious ritual, but as a way in which it shapes our, our relationship to God, to the world, to one another, and particularly to the kingdom of God. And, and, and to contextualize it, um, I've, I've put there Matthew's account of the baptism and, and temptation because that's significant. What is Jesus's baptism? Why does Jesus get baptized by John? Because John, John preaches a baptism of repentance. And all of the gospel writers are clear. If repentance is about saying, sorry, I've been really naughty, Lord, then Jesus is sinless. You know, that, that's what they say. And, and we get that unease in Matthew where where Jesus comes into the water and John looks at him and goes, hang on, shouldn't we be doing this the other way around? And Jesus says, no, no, we're going to do it this way for the time being. Does Jesus repent? Well, the gospel writers are absolutely clear that yes, Jesus does. That is what he is there to do. But what is the meaning of that repentance? It gets, it gets fleshed out. And it's about repentance is turning his back on his old life as a carpenter in Nazareth and embracing the kingdom and as its priority and its mission. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things about don't be anxious about your life. It's all part of the same sermon, isn't it? Don't be anxious about what you're going to eat. Don't be anxious about what you're going to wear. Don't be anxious about how you're going to provide for yourself. But seek first the kingdom of God and all of these things will be added to you. Of course, actually what, what Jesus is saying, he's not saying, you know, hit the beach, just light up a spliff and go, you know, hey, it's all going to be okay, <laughs> chill out. He's saying, actually, if you seek the kingdom and struggle for the kingdom, you, you become part of a community, the church, in which I don't have to worry about my back because I've got all of you watching my back. I've got to watch your back. So, so there's an intense realism about it. It's not some kind of otherworldly spirituality. In fact, as we'll see, Jesus' spirituality is absolutely engaged. So he goes into the wilderness and he's, he faces, according to Matthew, uh, Matthew, three temptations. Three temptations of bread. It's about food and sustenance. Who's going to feed you? Where do you get your daily bread from? And Jesus turns around and says, no, 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 it's, it's from God. And, and then the, 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 then, uh, then the devil takes him um, to the holy city and says, um, throw yourself down, protection. And, uh, and Jesus says, no, 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 we're not, we're not into that game. We're not relying on that kind of security. And the last thing that he's offered by Satan is worship. You can have all the kingdoms of the world. That's the kingdom of God, folks, all the kingdoms of the world. You can have all that without the cross, as long as you worship me. And Jesus basically says to Satan, look, will you just off? Because, because you can't have the kingdom of God that way. You cannot play games with empire. You cannot get it to work for you. You cannot compromise. You cannot reform it. You cannot fix it. 
it's got to die. And, and it's in that context that I want us to, to look at Jesus' prayer, because if that's his spirituality, you know, we often think, we often read it as though for Jesus, that's, it's settled once and for all. The, no more questions. He doesn't have to face any more questions in himself about how firmly committed he is to the, to the way of the cross. Until, until, of course, he gets to Gethsemane. And here we see Jesus sweating blood, don't we? And, we, and we're coming to Gethsemane when, when we go down the hill um, a little bit. But let's look at, let's look at his prayer, because, because I want us to see it as a discipleship prayer that, that shapes his spirituality as somebody who is consciously, continually engaged in a confrontation in God's name, in the name of the kingdom, with the Roman occupation. So he prays, Our Father in Heaven. Well, one of Caesar Augustus's many titles was Our Father in Heaven, did you know? Uh, isn't that surprising? Hallowed be your name, may your name be revered. First prayer for, for the disciples of Jesus is we pray for the coming of the kingdom. Now, you and I have prayed, and, uh, and the church have prayed this for millennia. And we go, well, yeah, that's what we say. We pray for God's kingdom and wouldn't it be nice? But if you're Jesus and if you're, if you're among his, his people, if you're among the Galilean peasantry of which he was a part, and you're praying, God, send your kingdom, what you really mean is, God, send your kingdom and get rid of the Romans. It's a prayer against the Roman Empire. It's against the structures of oppression. It's against the Roman occupation. Sending the kingdom is... Um, yeah, they're doing it. So to pray, so to pray for pray for the coming of God's kingdom is to pray for the demise of the empire and its rules. But the question, the question we perhaps need to ask ourselves that might, we might find more surprising is, who are the people who pray this prayer? I mean, obviously Jesus. But, but if you were to take a stab at the kind of, who's the socio-economic group that Jesus gathers around him that misfits. prays. Misfits. They are misfits. misfits. Yeah. And Jesus teaches them to pray. He says, guys, pray our Father. This is God's your Father. God's your Father. Even though, even though the church of its time has rejected you and said, God wants nothing to do with you, I, I Jesus, am telling you in God's name, you're welcome, you're my children. You're talking about people who do not have enough to get through the next 24 hours. That's the petition. Give us today our daily bread. Give us what we need, O oh God, to get through the next 24 hours, uh, uh, next 24 hours, or we're stuffed. Because we have no other means at our disposal. We have no other bread. We have no bread in store. It, it's like, the, it's like the, the Israelites in the wilderness. You remember? They, were, they, they, they couldn't, they couldn't collect the manna and keep it. It was daily bread that they had to rely on God for. And Jesus has just been in the wilderness where they spent 40 years. And, and he's teaching, pray to God, give us today our daily bread. And, 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 and I think I want to offer you two thoughts on that. The first thought is this. The people who are desperately poor need to pray to God for daily bread because nobody else has enough compassion to ensure that they are fed. So it points to the absence of compassion in the world. And it's an indictment on the way that we are. And the, and the Christian community is not to be like that. And, and that's why that description by Luke in Acts 2 of the Christian community that, that they looked after each other, they made sure each was fed, they sold all their possessions and put them in the common pot as it were. That's part of what it means to live out the prayer that Jesus has taught us. So number one, we live in a world without compassion and empire kills compassion. Empire um, promotes competition. Uh, empire says, I got to live at your expense. I, I can survive by getting one over on you. 
I can get more than I need and feel secure. Remember, Jesus said, I'm not into that kind of security when Satan offers it to him. Uh, I can do it by making sure I have some of what you need. Because if I've got an excess, then I feel safe. But then where are you? You're left praying, oh Lord, give me today what I need to get through the day. Yeah. The second thing I want to offer you is a thought from Richard Raw. Um, Catholic Franciscan retreat leader and and he said to he says this it is about compassion it is about an absence of compassion but remember this the person who gives you your daily bread owns your soul so we play by the rules whoever our employer is gets to say when we work when we don't work when we can when we can be at home with our families when we can't be um, under what conditions they're prepared to pay us and at what rate they're going to pay us and 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 Jesus says remember remember you shouldn't sell your soul out so on the one hand saying to God give us today our daily bread is 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 saying um, Lord the world's a horrible place but on the other hand it's a strategic thing which Jesus practiced which says I'm actually putting my trust ultimately in God and I'm not going to look elsewhere as a source for our daily bread so so that you know the disciples prayer question asks, uh, uh, prayer raises the question where do we look for our daily bread if we're going to pray At the end, he says, do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. Now, if you read that against, against the temptation narrative, which obviously we're supposed to do, um, Jesus is tempted, brought to the time of trial. Is he going to go through with his mission or not and save us from the evil one? But but there's another sense in which we are brought to the time of trial and Jesus is brought to, to the time of trial and will be and it's when he gets to Jerusalem and he gets to Gethsemane and this is the point at which Jesus comes absolutely within a hair's breadth of turning his back on his mission and saying you know I've preached this stuff I've lived this stuff I've ministered this stuff I've stood up for this stuff. I haven't compromised. I haven't made the deal. I haven't backed down. But you know what, God? As I'm looking at what lies ahead, uh, 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 I can't take this. Isn't there a way? God, can we, can we talk about this? <laughs> and that's what he says. Our Father. Um, Abba, Father. It's like, Daddy, I'm your kid. Do I have to do this? And, and I believe that this is what Jesus also means in saying, save us from the time of trial. There are times in our lives, and there are times in most people's lives, it's not, it's not always the case. But it is particularly if you're the biblical communities who are still under the kind of occupation that Jesus was under. It is still, if you're, if you're, if you're a Palestinian Christian, you know, under the kind of pressures they're, they're, they're under, there are times when actually there is so much pressure on us that it is possible that our faith is, is killed. We lose, we lose the faith. And I remember when Mandela was released in 19... Sorry, I keep going back to, to, to South African examples, but it's part of what formed me. And it's also, there are, you know, there are lots of parallels for me going on all the time with, with the South African situation. So in 1990, Mandela is released and it is announced that apartheid is going to be dismantled. And I was, I was in a room with a group of, of ANC activists, mostly black, few of us whites. And... Um, it was announced Mandela has been released apartheid is finishing and and the guy who was leading the had just made the announcement started you know praise the Lord and and isn't this wonderful and let's sing a hymn of praise because the kingdom is coming hallelujah and another guy stood up and he said I've just lost my faith I've lost everything I believed in and and we said you know why it's it's fair. he said because it's too late 
it's too late for my brother, it's too late for my mother, it's too late for my cousin. They were all killed resisting apartheid. They didn't see this day. Why did it take so long? If it can happen today, why didn't God make it happen, you know, six years ago? We, you know, we heard Nadal talking about the kind of stuff he's been through. And, and why isn't he broken or bitter or, uh, or violent and, and revengeful? Part of the answer is, is the community of which he's a part. But the last thing I want us to, to look at is the last thing that Jesus looks at, which is the issue of forgiveness. Because have you noticed that the one thing he thought was worth commenting about on the Lord's Prayer was the issue of forgiveness. And he says, if you don't forgive other people what they've done to you, then God will not forgive you. And first of all, it makes me wonder, why is it that in every confession that the when I go to church and often when I lead them why do, why do we pray um, I mean if I'm preaching I say to people quite often let's in a time of silence ask us, the Holy Spirit to search our hearts and let's make our confession to God why aren't I also saying and let us also make this a time of releasing those who have hurt us and with whom we are angry and where relationships are broken because otherwise, according to Jesus, there is no forgiveness. What, what is forgiveness for Jesus? The one thing it's not, it's not about a rule, it's not a bargain. Okay, God, I'll forgive William um, if you forgive me. Uh, it doesn't work like that. You, we're not making bargains with God. If we live in a world in which God comes and says, I'm offering you the kingdom, and it's for the least first. So we've got to recognize the reality that the least and the most powerful are actually enemies. It, it, the parable of Dives and Lazarus, the rich guy is responsible for the poverty and appalling conditions in which, which he lives. The Israelis are responsible for the conditions in which the Palestinians live, you know? It, there is there is this thing where people have wronged each other and where some are en they are enemies of each other what do you do with that and Jesus said you cannot do anything with that there is nothing to be done about that we don't do the URC very typical Christian stuff which is we pretend that there isn't a problem and so so forgiveness is is Easter Sunday to the breakdown in relationships Good Friday and and that's what happens on the cross that, that that's how forgiveness works because it makes possible a new relationship mm -hmm.